Good morning. This morning I'm reading Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from me, from your being in union with the Messiah, or any comfort flowing from love, any fellowship with me in the Spirit, or any compassion and sympathy, then complete my joy by having a common purpose and a common love, by being one in heart and mind. Do nothing out of rivalry or vanity, but in humility regard each other as better than yourselves. Look out for each other's interests and not just for your own. Let your attitude toward one another be governed by your being in union with Messiah Yeshua. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God, something to be possessed by force. On the contrary, he emptied himself in that he took the form of a slave by becoming like human beings are. And when he appeared as a human being, he humbled himself still more by becoming obedient even to death, death on a stake as a criminal. Therefore, God raised him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that in honor of the name given Yeshua, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Yeshua, the Messiah, is Adonai, to the glory of God the Father. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Eileen. Good morning. morning. Okay, thank you. We've gone through the birthday thing. We have. I'm I'm old. I'm 29. Just I'm trying not to try not to brag too much because I know I look a little bit older than that. But uh, if you add 40, or no, that's too old. If you add if you add 30 years to that, it would be accurate. But uh, but welcome to I welcome to you who who may be watching online as well. I'm I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we'll get into his word in the book of John. Father, I thank you for this morning and the opportunity that the children have, first of all, to go downstairs and to be taught. And we pray for our children that each one of them would grow in a meaningful relationship with you. We pray for our teachers that are doing the very important work of loving those children, encouraging those children, and teaching those children, that you give them all the energy and strength that they need. Father, we see what's happening in our culture, and it's discouraging. A lot of people are discouraged, a lot of people are fearful, a lot of people are depressed. And I pray, Father, that we would be shining the truth of who you are into those, those hearts and into those lives. Give us the encouragement we need, the power we need, the energy we need in order to do that. Boldness that we need. And Father, I thank you so much. As we look at the passage today, we think about birthdays. I think about Jesus, God in the flesh. God, eternity passed before there was time. We stepped into time and took on a human tent in order to die for my sin, in order to be raised to life and give us victory and give us hope and give us meaning, give us purpose, give us eternal life. We declare that you are worthy. We declare that your son is worthy. And I pray that as we look at your word right now, you bring it alive to us. Prepare our hearts to receive, not what I have to say, but what you have to say in your word. I pray that you would prepare each heart to be fertile, myself first and foremost, to receive what you have to say to each one of us this day. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Martin Luther once said, The mystery of the humanity of Christ, that he sunk himself into our flesh, is beyond all human understanding and i have to agree it's hard to comprehend god of the universe god who created everything god who's outside of time who transcends time who comes in to our time as a human being in order to do everything that he did which includes dying for our sin and being raised victoriously is an extremely important truth and it is beyond my ability to comprehend why god would do that how God can do that. All of that is beyond me, but it's important 
to meditate upon as well. Now, in our home, we have a gecko. He's a crested gecko. And on occasion, I've had to handle him to clean his cage for one reason or another. Every now and then that happens. Last time I had to pick him up, I picked him up and I held him kind of with, with a thumb on him so he wouldn't go jumping anywhere. And uh, this little gecko, he started just biting me like crazy. Just, like, ah, just all over my hand, just everywhere he could. Now, he doesn't have teeth, all right? He's gumming me. He's pinching just a little bit as he does that. I'm thinking, man, if he only understood, I'm here to help him. What I'm doing right now is trying to help him. But I'm sure he was very fearful, even though I meant him no harm, take care of him, provide everything he needs to live. In fact, without me, he would die. I am the reason he is alive. But he doesn't understand that. I think the only way I could communicate with him in a way that he would understand would be to, be to become a gecko and live life as a gecko so that he and I could communicate however geckos do that. Of course, I can't do that. But if I could, if I had some sort of power, if I had some sort of superhuman power where I could become a gecko, do you think I would? No. Would you? No. No, I, I, I think not. I don't think I would at all. That God would become human flesh, I think, is even more amazing and greater loss in standing than in me becoming a gecko. Yet not only can God do this, he did do that. He was willing because he loves people created in his image. Jesus gave up much by taking on human flesh, but he did not give up his deity. He is still and always will be by nature 100% God. It's just that now he is also 100% human. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, from the passage Eileen just read from, it says, who, referring to Jesus, being in very nature, who is he in very nature? God. Did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So he stepped into time, he stepped into our existence, and he lowered himself to the point of becoming human. And it was a great lowering and humility that took place. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient death to death, even death on a cross, on a painful cross, on a criminal's cross, a humiliation and pain that... It's hard to imagine that the God of the universe lowered himself to that extent. We serve a very humble God. Well, in the book of John, so far we have looked at the origin of the eternal word, who is Jesus. We also saw the long prophesied witness of the eternal word, word the one that prophesied in the Old Testament, in the person of John the Baptist. And today we marvel at the eternal word of God taking on human flesh and becoming one of us. And it really is a marvel. And so our passage is John chapter 1, verse 9 to 18. I invite you to turn with me uh, to John chapter 1. If you're watching at home, I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 9 through 18. And we're beginning with verse 9. John chapter 1, verse 9 says, The true light that gives light to how many? Everyone was coming into the world. Which is amazing. God coming into the world our existence as a human being. Jesus alone is the true light. It calls him the true light here. There is no other true light. There are a lot of false lights that flicker and attract people, but they're not the real thing. They eventually, their light will go out. It's not lasting because it's not the true light. It's false. And we need to understand that Jesus is the true light that we need to see. We don't want to be fooled by something that would be fake, be phony, and could lead to some pretty serious consequences. In the Spokesman Review, December 8, 1984, it was reported that an estimated 10,000 physicians, I'm going to say that again, 10,000 physicians had phony foreign medical degrees that brought one broker of fraudulent diplomas $1.5 million over three years. Congressman Claude Pepper said that many Americans may be receiving medical treatment from doctors who lied on their medical school loan applications and used the money not to go to school, but to pay for fake documents saying they completed school and training. For some of you, that may explain a few things. Um, Pedro de Mazones, who served a three-year prison sentence for mail fraud and conspiracy, 
told the panel that in three years of expediting med medical degrees, I like he was expediting medical degrees, uh, he provided about 100 clients with false transcripts showing they had fulfilled medical requirements of schools they didn't even attend. He said, clients paid me from $5,225 to $27,000 for my services. And you know, that's a really good deal. Medical school is a whole lot more expensive than that. Uh, so he, he provided an interesting service to them, didn't he? He went on to say that he, in all, he earned about $1.5 million in those three years, but he said he only got to keep about 500000 of this total. The rest went for bribes and expenses. Sounds like a quality, quality person of integrity, I know. But let me ask you, how many of you want to be operated on by a fake doctor? And my guess is if we took a poll here, the percentage would be around zero. Of course, you don't want to be operated on by a false doctor. But even more important than a false doctor is someone who's a fake messiah, a false god, something that promises something that is absolutely not true, that will destroy our eternal soul, if you will. We don't want to entrust our eternal destinies with something that is a lie. Jesus, it says here, is the true God. He is the real deal. He is the true light. His light has lasted forever and will last forever. He's a genuine article, the pure revelation of God to man. As it says in John chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself, who is he? God. And is in closest relationship with the Father. You think about it, God has existed forever in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's been a relationship, a loving relationship for eternity past. He has stamped that truth upon his creation. And that's why we long for relationship and we long for relationship with him. Is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Hebrews 1.3 says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. If you look at Jesus, you are looking at God. You're looking at the true God, the true light of the world. Now in our passage, we see how the world's going to respond to the true light, the incarnation of Jesus. The creator is coming down to his creation. How does the creation respond? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 10 to 13, it says he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him or did not know him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, and this is still true today, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The world did not recognize Jesus for who he is. Now, the word for recognize here means to know. And that's why some of your translations, like the New American Standard Bible will translate it as they did not know him. Or the King James Version says they knew him not. We need to know him. Even though Jesus is the pre-existent God, the world did not recognize him for who he is. They did not know him. Verse 11 says that his own did not receive him. His own people could be referring to the Jews who did not recognize the Messiah, but the Jews are representative of all humanity. The world of sinful humanity that is alienated from God did not recognize their creator. They did not know him. The idea of knowing him means more than knowing about him. Do you know him for who he is? Is there a relationship? This is very important. You know, we used to live in Denver, the home of the Denver Broncos. I'm not a Bronco fan. Yes, there are any Bronco fans out there? Is that, is that what that was? Okay, we got, we got a couple of you out there. Uh, my wife would be joining in as well. Um, now, the Denver fans are kind of crazy. They're pretty serious about their team. Now, when I lived in Green Bay, nobody was crazier than those people. I lived just to the north of Green Bay. Those people were flat out nuts. But Denver Bronco fans are pretty crazy as well. And you could say maybe one of the more popular quarterbacks, maybe the best quarterback in their minds that they had was a guy named John Elway. Now, I never met John Elway, but I can say I know him. Right? We use it like that. I know him. If I see him on a commercial, uh, when I was in Denver, lived in the area, I'd see him right That's John Elway. Knew him just like that. Knew his, knew his image, knew his face. That's John Elway. But do I know him? Is there a relationship? No, I know about him. I can identify him. I can tell you statistics about him, especially if I have a cheat sheet. Now, I once met linebacker Carl Mecklenburg. I shook his hand, briefly talked with him, even received an autograph photo, and we talked about the Lord, a Christian brother. But do I know him? No. Through the Promise Keepers ministry, I met with linebacker Randy Gratishar on several occasions, which was a real thrill for me because he was kind of a childhood hero. I prayed with him and even ate with him, but I don't 
know him. There's no ongoing relationship, and he likely doesn't even remember me. Do you know Jesus? Not just do you know about him, or do you know some facts, or you know some trivia, you know who, who he was, you know some different things. Is there an ongoing, growing relationship with him? And it is critically important that we have that. We're not talking about a head knowledge. We're talking about a relationship. We're talking about knowing. We're talking walking with him day in and day out. Philippians 3, 8 to 11 says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. We can know him, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Do you want to know Christ? Can you say that and mean it? Is it a passion? Is he a priority? He doesn't want to be just a non-existent thing, like some sort of, you know, leave him in the manger kind of a situation, or somebody you know about. He doesn't, he doesn't want that. Is he a priority? Is he a passion? If you had a list of your five highest passions, would he even be on the list? Do you not think about Jesus day in and day out? Where is he on your list? How important is he? Or isn't he? Can you say, I want to know Christ? Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. The sinful world of humanity did not receive him, our passage says in John chapter 1. The Greek word there, paralambano, means to receive the self like a, like a husband receives his bride. It's the same word that was used in Matthew one twenty when the angel told Joseph not to be afraid to receive or take Mary to be his wife. It's the same word that's used in John 14, 3, when Jesus talks about coming back and receiving his bride to himself, taking us to be with him. The sinful world of humanity did not receive him. Have you received him? Have you re received him to yourself in an intimate, growing relationship? Verse 12 tells us that those who did receive him are born again. The Jews as a nation did not receive him, but... Some individual Jews did, and individuals, of course, still can. Again, I can't overestimate or overstate the importance of this. This is more than a head knowledge about Jesus. This is more than an acknowledgement that he existed, or that maybe you think he's God even. It's more than that. James 2.19 says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder, as in shudder and fear. That's not what we're talking. We're not talking about intellectual assent. We're not talking about a head knowledge. We're not talking about acknowledging that he is or that he existed. We're talking about something much more important. The receiving that John is talking about is taking Jesus by the hand and walking hand in hand through life's journey together. He is your partner for life. You've placed your trust and hope in him. To those who receive him and put their complete trust in him, they become children of God. Now, this is also important. We are not children of God before that. Sometimes I hear people say, well, we're all children of God. You no, know, we're all created in his image, but we are not all children of God. We're created in his image, but we are not all his children. Being born of God refers to a spiritual birth. In verse 13, it says, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So we all have an active body, right? If we're living, at least most people. <laughs> We all have an active soul, although when you look at our world, sometimes you wonder. But we do not all have an active living spirit until it comes to life through faith in Christ. We are born of God, not human reproduction or human will, but God's will. That is what we talk about in spiritual birth. People are not by nature children of God. We become his child by receiving Christ, depending on his work on the cross for our sin. Now, our passage says we must believe in the name of Jesus. That is, we accept all that his name declares him to be. We're not simply talking about intellectual assent. We are talking about complete allegiance. Does Jesus have your allegiance? Every now and then you hear of someone who tried Jesus. I tried Jesus and it just wasn't for me. Jesus said this would happen in the parable of the sower. That people would try him but fall away. People have to be all in. We need to have allegiance or we'll only follow when things are comfortable. And he said things are going to be hard. There's hard things in the world. 
You know, he, told, he said, <laughs> he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He said that in John 16, 33. I am a Detroit Lions fan. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I say that proudly. It takes a lot of loyalty to remain a Detroit Lions fan. We've never been to a Super Bowl, and I don't believe we ever will. We are once again rebuilding. We have been rebuilding since 1958, before I was born. But through it all, I'm loyal. I know full well that we'll probably be 0 and 5 after today. We're 0 5 and 4 entering into today. And if anyone saw the, the Ravens and Lions ending a few weeks ago, when they actually looked like they were going to beat a better team, Baltimore's a good team. We've got them at home, and we're going to win. And what does Baltimore do? They kick the longest field goal in NFL history, 66 yards. And any Lions fan knows when you kick the ball and it hits the, it hit the, up, it hit the, the crossbar, every Lions fan knows which way it's going to bounce. Because we have seen this kind of thing over and over again. It's going to bounce over if it's against us. If we were kicking it, it would bounce the other way. That's just the way that it goes. And they didn't even call a, a, a delay of game penalty that led into that. It's like we invent ways to lose. We're good at it. But through it all, I'm loyal. I'm not looking for any convenient replacement. Jesus seeks complete allegiance. We're to be all in, not looking for convenient replacements when times are tough. You know, I made a decision for Christ that was informed. I was raised by a mom who became a very strong believer and a dad who at the time was an atheist. And I started looking into the Bible to see if there's any truth to it. And I kind of assumed there wasn't. It was a pie in the sky, hope and dream for crazy people. And then I started looking at it. And I looked at the authenticity of scripture and I started looking. That's why I love apologetics. I started looking at all this. Like, oh my goodness, the evidence is overwhelming. This is the word of God. He died for my sin. He rose from the dead and he's going to come back. And it became crystal clear to me. And then I had to make a decision. And I decided to be all in. It hasn't always been easy, but he has my allegiance. So let me ask you, is he worthy of that allegiance? Does he deserve that allegiance? Well, we're looking at our passage in John 1, 14 to 18. We see the eternal word became flesh. God saw that we had incredible need. He came into our existence, died for my sin and blood place, rose from the dead, defeating my enemies of sin, death, and Satan so that I could have eternal life with him. Yes, I think he is worthy. As a matter of fact, I can't express my worthiness enough. It falls far, far short of what he deserves. In John chapter 1, verse 14 to 18, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling or tent among us. We have seen his glory. Now, there's an interesting illusion that's going here. In the Old Testament, you had the tent of tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And the, the Shekinah glory of God went into that tent and, 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 and dwelt in a special way amongst them. Well, the, same, the wording here is looking at Jesus as he's coming and he's tenting among us. And the Shekinah glory of God is seen in the life and person of Jesus. God in the flesh. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do we need grace and truth today? John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. What's John the Baptist saying? I was born before he was, but he existed well before me. He's always existed. Out of his fullness, we have received all grace and place of grace already given. Lots of grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. known. Jesus is the God-man. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. The incarnation is God with us in the flesh, Emmanuel. Now, in Colossians 1.19, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, now, this word for dwell here is different in the Greek and the word that we see in John chapter 1, verse 14. Here, it does not mean a temporary residence like a tent. It is a permanent establishment. It is by nature who he is. He became what we are, human, without relinquishing who he is and always has been, the eternal God, Yahweh. And Jesus lived among us. He dwelt among us during his earthly ministry, and he gave us the ultimate gift, and that he gave us himself. I love that about him. If you want to look about it, is, is he really a relational God? He could have given us a lot of things, but what he gave us ultimately was himself. 
was a relationship. Have you received him? Have you received the relationship? There's a story of a good and wise king who ruled in Persia long ago. And he loved his people and he wanted to know how they lived. He wanted to know about their hardships. And he often dressed in clothes of a working man or commoner or beggar and went to the homes of the poor. And no one whom he visited thought he was their ruler. And one time he visited an extremely poor man who lived in a cellar. He ate the coarse food the poor man ate. He spoke cheerful, kind words to him. Then he left. But he liked this particular one. And so he kept going back again and again and built a relationship. And later he visited the poor man again and disclosed his identity by saying, I'm your king and giving proof. And the king thought the man would surely ask for some gift or favor, but he did not. Instead, he said, you left your palace and your glory to visit me in this dark, dreary place. You ate the coarse food I ate. You brought gladness to my heart. To others, you've given your rich gifts. To me, you have given yourself. And that's exactly right. God gave us himself through the incarnation. He gave us a relationship. Have you received that? Have you received him? You know, one way you're going to know is what are you passionate about? If you have no passion, no interest in Jesus at all, then there is a problem. Are you passionate about Jesus? Is it at least on your list of priorities? Now, again, the word for dwelling in verse 14 means to live in a tent, to take up residence, a temporary residence. And this is an allusion, as I said, to the tabernacle of the covenant, the tent of meeting, where God took up residence in the tabernacle. On earth, Jesus was the Shekinah glory of God, the visible expression of the glory of God in our midst. And in Jesus, we have seen God's glory as he took up residence in a human tent. Jesus is unique. Some people say all the religions are the same. No, they're not. They're not even close. Jesus is extremely unique. He's one of a kind, the only God-man and our only Savior. We come to the Father. Jesus came from the Father. And our passage says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. He is the unmerited favor of God to us. He is the true, essential character of God expressed in human form. And he gives us himself for our benefit so that we can know him. Now in verse four, or 15 of our passage, we see once again a testimony from John the Baptist. that kind of alludes to that. We saw it in verses 6 to 8. We're going to see it again later in chapter 1 and other parts of the book of John. But basically what John is saying is even though John was born before Jesus, Jesus is greater. He is superior because he has always existed. Jesus is superior to John. He wants people to know that. He is superior to all, and we must keep our eyes on him. We can get distracted and we forget that he is superior. He's superior to this world. He's superior to challenges we face. He's superior to COVID. He's superior to government overreach. He's superior to the disappointments we face and to the obstacles that are in front of us all of the time. And he's superior to our enemies of sin, death, and Satan. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he as you than he is in the world. We must persevere to keep our eyes on our Savior and his salvation. Because we can get distracted. Are your eyes on Jesus? Are they ever on Jesus? On Jesus sometimes, all the time? Are you distracted? You know, one time I was uh, at Lake Powell and we had a, a man whose ministry actually had a lot to do with Lake Powell. I love Lake Powell. And he had a lot of money, he had a lot of boats, and he had this big boat. And we would go out and retreat in our 20-something group, and about 20 in our 20-something group went on this retreat. And, and so he was transporting us with a smaller boat to his larger boat in this marina. And I was with the last group that he was picking up. And so he, he came to pick us up and he wanted to get there before dark. And he said, hey, Rich, would you like to drive the boat? Sure. So I'm driving the boat and I'm just loving Lake Powell. I'm looking around, there's scenery, the rock formations. As I'm looking around, I'm doing this. I'm kind of going through the water like this. And it's driving him nuts. And he's sitting there and he finally, because he wants to get there before dark, he says, Rich, I want to get there before dark. Here's what I want you to do. There's the marina. See the light of the marina? That's it. That light right there. That's what you're looking at. He says, you point the nose of this boat to that light and you drive it there. You know what happened after that? A most curious thing happened. I went straight. I went straight to the lo location that we were supposed to be going to. I didn't wander all over the place. Well, the same principle is true of Jesus. If we're looking around all over the place and we're getting distracted, we're not going to go the right direction. We're not going to go straight. We're not going to be in the center of his will. We're not going to care about his will. And so we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. 
We must also remember that because he's superior, other need, others need to see him and not us. As John the Baptist said in John 3.30, he must become greater, I must become less. People don't need to see us. They really do need to see the Lord. They really do need to see Jesus. Last week, we looked at some, some illustrations that were in Scripture itself, right? Where you are the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You're reflecting his light. He even referred to John and to us like lamps that shine, reflect the light of Jesus. And, and we looked at lighthouses, and we thought about, well, you know, it, it's kind of like that as well. Well, another metaphor could be we are telescopes. They look through us to see Jesus, and he is worthy of being seen. They don't need to see me, and they don't need to see you. They need to see Jesus. We all need to see Jesus. He is the one who became flesh. He is the one who became man. He is the one who is God in the flesh who fulfills our true needs. He became one of us and died in our place and rose victoriously. You know what that is? That's grace. That's grace given to us in abundance over and over again. That he became a human being. That he died in my place. That he offers salvation. That his, his work on the cross is applied to me. That's all grace. Salvation, grace, eternal life with him, grace. It's all grace upon grace, and that's what our passage is pointing out. Verse 16 reminds us that we have a constant supply of his grace. In John 1, verse 16 to 17, it says, Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Lots of grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Are you falling into sinful habits? Are you having bad times, bad moments? He is the Savior fall on his grace. You know, the law was given through Moses to point us to the grace of Jesus, to the grace that we need. That was the point, and we fall upon his grace all the time. The law reveals our need. We look through it like a telescope that reveals our need for Christ. In Romans 3, 19 to 20, it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, the whole world held accountable to God. How many mouths are going to be silenced? And, and how much of the world is going to be accountable to God? Therefore, how many people will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law? None. No one. Do you get that? This is a bait I have with people over and over again. Sometimes even here. No, you're not good enough. Well, I stand before God. I, he'll be impressed with who I am. It's just, you know, I'm basically good. He'll look at me and think I'm basically good. No, he doesn't. He tells you he's going to look at you and say, you're not one sin falls short, you fall short. I have a perfect standard, God says, and you've fallen short of the standard, and I've made a provision. And if you reject my provision, you've rejected the only provision. And we need to understand that. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, by our effort. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. You know, it's true. I look through the Old Testament, and you look at some of the laws, and I'm thinking, oh, guilty, guilty, guilty. Every now and then I look and I think, I'm not guilty of that one. And then I look at the New Testament and Jesus says, well, what about the heart, Rich? Okay, I'm guilty. I never murdered one. What about in your heart? Oh, I've murdered some people in my heart before. <laughs> I'm sure some people have murdered me in their heart before. It's more than once my wife has looked at me and said, I love you, but I don't like you right now. Did she murder me in her heart? I bet she has. <laughs> and I don't blame her for a second. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. We need to repent of sin and embrace the grace given through Jesus. Our problem is sin. We need, what we need is not happiness. What we need is righteousness. And people don't always understand it. Sometimes I'll talk to someone and say, I'm happy. I don't need Jesus. I'm happy just the way I am. Well, you won't be happy in hell, right? And uh, what we need is, is, is righteousness. We need to be standing before him, not in our own but work, but what he has accomplished. And the law points to the grace of Jesus, to his righteousness. And Jesus is God in the flesh, and he explains God perfectly. When we look at him, we are looking at God. In John 1, 18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relation with the Father, literally at the Father's side or bosom, has made him known or exegeted him. No one has ever seen the Father. Jesus is the unique Son of God. He is from the Father's bosom. He has an intimate relationship with the Father. Whereas all people are ignorant of God and distant, Jesus is intimately acquainted with the Father, is himself God, and explains him fully. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 7 to 9, If you really know me, not know about me, but know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. <laughs> will it? 
<laughs> pretty, pretty big request. But Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? And we could put in the blank for us as well. Don't you know me? Fill in the blank with your own name. Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus has made the Father known. He exegetes him. We use this word in the church. It's a theological term from the Greek word that comes here in verse 18 in making him known called exegesis. How many have heard the term exegesis before? Okay, most of you have heard that term before. All that means is that when we come to Scripture, we exegete it. We draw out. We, we want to find the truth of the Scripture and draw it out. We want to make it known. We don't want to do eisegesis, which is reading into Scripture, our idea, which is false. We want to avoid that. Well, Jesus reveals the Father and helps us to understand who God is. He exegetes him. He makes him known so that we're not led astray. Jesus is our entry into knowing God. He is a true light. Other lights are eisegesis, and they'll lead you away from him. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Are you knowing him more and more in an ever-growing relationship? You know, we know his word, we seek him in prayer, we worship him. All these ways are to grow in that relationship. But the goal is Jesus. The goal is Jesus himself. It's that relationship. What I love about God, he's always drawing nearer to us. You know, I think about in the Old Testament, we, we have him appear to Abraham. We had Genesis 3 and the sin and all, everything comes from that. And people are wandering their own direction. And God says, I need to save these people. I need to make myself known. He chose Abraham. He said, through you and through your people and your descendants, I'm going to make myself known. I want you to make sure that the people know about me. Well, that wasn't close enough, right? He said, you know what? You're going to make this tent of meeting, this tabernacle. And my, my glory, I'm going to dwell there in a special place. Well, that's not close enough. So he became one of us. He actually became a human being to walk amongst us, and it still wasn't close enough. So he died in our place, and he gave us the Holy Spirit, and now he indwells us. And when you look at Revelation 21 and 22, he's going to be the light that you see and the air that you breathe. He's going to be surrounding you completely, still indwelling you, as I understand it, completely around, because we need him. He's always drawing closer. Know him, not just about him. Do you understand your need for him? Now, in closing, there's just two things I want to say. For those of you who are watching online, you're here, who are believers, this is an important truth. We must keep our eyes upon Jesus and keep focus. Understand other people need to see him. Let's make sure our relationship is growing. What incredible privilege we've been given. What an opportunity we've given. Where God of the universe has said, please enter into a relationship with me. We can receive that or we can reject it. And when we receive it, we need to feed it. We need to be getting into his word and doing things that help us and put an environment to grow. Are you growing in him? And there's the other side of this equation. Maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here and you've yet to receive Jesus personally. You've yet to personally have a relationship with him, receive his work on the cross in your place so that you can end a relationship with the Holy Spirit's indwelling you. One of my nightmares that I have frequently, well, I, I say not, it's more of a daymare, right, when I think about it. It's not like I'm sleeping thinking about it. But one of the things I'm concerned about is standing before God and God saying, Rich, I gave you these people to tell the truth to, and you failed. Several of them aren't here. That's a miserable thought. Miserable thought. Have you placed your faith in Jesus' work on the cross? Because one thing I can tell them, I can look back and say, I told them over and over and again, I told them, I showed them in scripture, they need to know you, they need to have a relationship with you. Do you? Not just do you know about him, not have you been to church a lot, not have you been a good person. Do you know him? Are you passionate about him? Is he a priority? Is he important in your life? Or is he just like some sort of insurance card you have in your back pocket? Yeah, I said a prayer once. I think I'm fine. That's not knowing him. Prayer is one way to express it, but knowing him is taking him. And he is your God and he is your Lord and you follow him. That's what we're talking about. Have you done that? Everyone individually needs to do that. But you're online, you're here. Have you done that? And if you have not, would you do it today? It's extremely important. This stuff is real. Look at the world around us. Anybody who understands prophecy looks at the world around us is going to have a pretty quick equation to figure out that the word is true and that Jesus is real. 
If you look at the rebirth of Israel alone, I'll get you that point. Do you know him? If you do not, I'm going to give you the chance, like I always do, to receive him. It's not me. I do nothing. I just simply pray and give you opportunity. But Jesus has to prompt you. The Holy Spirit has to prompt your heart. And if that is happening and you have not responded to Christ, would you make sure that you respond today? I'm going to pray, and prayer is one way to communicate this. And if God prompts you, pray along with me right now in your heart to receive that relationship with him. Pray, pray with me now. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place on the cross for my sin. I am a sinner. I have fallen short of your standard. I need help. I need you. I need a savior. You are my savior. I receive you as my savior. And I trust that today I am your child and I always will be. And you'll indwell me with the Holy Spirit. And I will walk with you hand in hand, so to speak, each and every day for the rest of my life. Take my life and use it so other people can see you through me. This I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.